We're going to talk about one thing, and it's going to be about an hour on one thing, and so you can tell that we're going to explore different sides of it. It's been interesting to me that in our field of sort of out of school time and after school, but also in a variety of other youth fields, the question that seems to be driving policy folks and practitioners and frankly research is shifting. And it's shifted from the way that we used to talk about this, which was do these programs make a difference for kids, to a different question. The different question is why are some activities such that they improve youth outcomes and other activities don't. So it's shifted from the does it make a difference to why does it make a difference when it works. And it's also shifted from programs to activities within programs. And this is happening in public K-12 education. You know, we used to think good school, not so good school. Now we think effective classroom, not such an effective classroom. We used to think about strong mentoring program, great big brothers, big sisters site, not such a great big brothers, big sisters site. Now we think strong mentoring dyad, not such a strong mentoring dyad, right? So all of this stuff is, is getting more, less about the big global program or school and more about the activities that go on within any particular program in the school. And less do they make a difference and more why is that the case? You see these TV shows or these Hollywood movies and you got these people pitching the producer or something and they say, you know, sort of high concept, I'm going to give you the storyline, you know, Angelina Jolie, end of the world, big bang, what do you think? This, that's called high concept, right? That's the high concept storyline. This is a low concept storyline. We're going to work through six things that I'm going to talk with you about today and I'm going to dwell just a second on them now and then I'm going to come back to it. One is, is that while it's very frustrating, that we seem to keep debating the purpose of out-of-school time programs or after-school programs, I'm going to convince you that those debates are endless. They will never stop happening because they have reoccurred time and again as various trends and megatrends in the society have asked different things of these programs at different points in, in the life of, uh, of the United States and our society. And it is no different in that regard than the kinds of debates that people have in K-12 education or youth mentoring or child welfare or juvenile justice or youth employment or any of those other systems. If you think that those guys know what their mission is and they're kind of settled on it and everything's cool and then they can go about getting their business done, then why do people keep hassling us in after school? It's because you haven't been living in those other worlds where people probably look at after school and think, why are those guys so settled? Why are we such in such turmoil? I'll talk about some of those debates. The debates also have, at any point in time, remarkable similarity. So sometimes there'll be a lot of conversation about supply of programs, sometimes there'll be a lot of conversation about quality of programs, sometimes it'll be about staff, sometimes it'll be about kids, whatever, and I'm going to help you try and understand why we're having the kinds of conversations we're now having in after school. Three other, one other thing that uh, I think is, is kind of interesting is, is that research in all of these fields has now shown that some programs, for reasons that we don't quite understand, make a big and positive difference for kids. It's just true. I'm going to show you how it's true, and you can probably think of it as being true that some schools make a huge difference. Other schools don't make much of a huge difference. Some mentoring dyads are transformative for kids. Other mentoring dyads don't make much of a difference for kids. Some child welfare services not only work on stability and, but, uh, and uh, permanency planning, but has somehow managed to do family reunification at the same time in good kinds of ways. Other programs don't do those kinds of things. And it's a real perplexing thing because it does show us that things are good and can happen in almost every system. So the question shifts, why is that going on and how can we do more of that? One of the things that is also true is, is that the research that I'm going to help share with you today points its finger in every, one of these, in every one of these systems toward what goes on between the adults that are line workers and the kids that are in the services. You know, this may be reassuring for young people in the room, but I am a testament to the fact that you can have only one or two ideas in your life that are any good at all, and you can ride them for 38 years, right? <laughs> so one of the things that, that I've always thought was that adults matter. You know, parents make a difference. Uh, early childhood staff make a difference in what goes on. After school workers are important. And it's really the case because they're important in how they shape the daily actions that they have with kids and how they interact with kids. And the same exact thing is the case as we now understand with teachers. And it's if you can't, if you can't focus on the point of service in your work, then you're somehow going to be missing something important. It's a theme that's going to come up a number of times. Second thing is, is that I think that, interestingly enough, 
we're now starting to have some consensus about what are the practices at the point of service that really get you the kind of outcome change that you want to get. And that consensus is emerging across all of these fields. I'll talk a little bit about that. And then finally, it's nice to be able to identify effective practices, but it's more important to not only identify them, but try to create them when they don't particularly exist, right? So I think we are also starting to have some clues on this one, that we are across these fields again, beginning to learn about the kinds of interventions that we can make in policy or management practices or things like that, that induce good things to happen at the point of service. So that's the storyline that I'm gonna be following today. Now, this is a slide that I had some fun with plan, you know, creating because these are some of the kinds of debates that I think go on in all of these fields. What is the purpose of, now just insert, Right? What is the purpose of any one of the things that I have in footnote one you can stick in there? What is the purpose of child welfare? Is it family reunification or is it permanency planning? What is the purpose of juvenile justice? Is it remediation or is it punishment or is it both in some way? What is the purpose of youth employment? Getting kids quick jobs so that they can learn in the labor market or building the skills of kids over time so that they can get good jobs and don't have to come back into training programs? What's the purpose of after school? Is it child care? Is it safety? Is it academic improvement? Is it, you know, doing better generally with youth development? What about schools? Preparation for life or preparation for general dispositions and sort of ability to learn? In every one of these fields, there's debates that roil the fields, drive the practitioners crazy, and they are the product of things going on in the rest of society. There's debates about structure. In our field, is it, you know, should we have co-locative services? How much should the CBO be in the, in the front? How much should school be in the front? What's the relationship between those two? How can we braid funding streams so that structures fit funding streams? Should we put everything in one place? Should we distribute it and have resource and referral intermediary kind of activities that get people to the right thing that they need? What should go on? The same kind of debates occur in all of these other services. Who should pay for this stuff? Those three things, those three things will never be solved by research. Research doesn't have much to say about any of that kind of stuff. These are matters of taste, of community resources, of particular ways of thinking about how to put this stuff together in various communities, and there's no one right answer to these things. They will be constantly debated, though, as community resources change, as families and populations change, and the rest of it. The place that research can be a little helpful to us, a little helpful to us, is what policies and practice actually improve the effects of insert after school programs, schools, youth employment, et cetera. And also, what should, and now I'm shifting to this thing about the adults, what should parents, big brothers, child care workers, youth workers, early childhood teachers, whatever the word is going to be, child welfare staff, what should they do to actually make a difference with young people? Given all of that, and given the fact that now we're making the world a little more complex, it's kind of interesting to me the way we often talk about our field. You know? This is sort of the standards, product of the standards movement, right? So, what we want you to do is we want you to take kids, we want you to bring them into your program, and we want to get certain outcomes that we will hold you accountable for. And we want you to produce and measure those outcomes so that we know what's going on. And we all sort of buy into this. It sounds sensible, you know? If, if you want to know what difference the thing is making, you ought to focus on something. You want to align your services in particular ways. You ought to have some idea about the goals that you're trying to achieve. But let's face it, it's a little bit of a promise or dealing with the devil when you make this kind of bet, right? Because you know, as soon as you say this, that when the rising tide is improving youth outcomes, you probably can always look good. When the rising tide is headed in the different direction, you're probably always going to look bad. Let me give you some examples. If you were working with adolescent, on adolescent pregnancy prevention during the 90s and, the, and up into the early part of this decade, you were looking pretty good, practically by doing nothing. The trend in adolescent pregnancy was going down during that period of time. If you were working on handgun deaths and handgun control when the crack epidemic came into our cities, there was nothing that you could do not to look good, not to look bad, given the amount of, of adolescent uh, homicide that was going on in every city in America as crack epidemic came into the cities. So these larger trends, if you're working on youth employment, it's pretty hard to succeed in the same way right now as it was to be able to succeed three years ago, given the nature of the change in opportunities for youth employment, right? So one of the things that goes on in the standards movement, particularly in programs that uh, can choose who it is that they are going to work with, is it can distort the nature of services. We've seen this time again 
in systems like youth employment or frankly like after school where people can make some decisions about who it is that they're going to serve. You make the outcomes really high stakes. And I know as a program practitioner, if I'm going to get paid based upon placement rates and stability of placement rates in jobs, who it is that I'm going to start serving, right? I'm going to start serving more job-ready kids. If you're going to pay me for my adult or my dropout education program based on GED completions, you know, it's going to be pretty hard for me to take kids in between zero and four literacy levels and, and try and run an ABE program knowing how far away that is from GEDs, right? One of the things that is also true is, is that any one of these systems that I have been saying is affected by what's going on, not only in the rest of the world, but in the other places. Think about this. Think about how changes in the demography of the American population are changing the pool of people that might present themselves at the doors of an after-school program. It's going on in every city in the United States, right? Simply thinking about things like changes in the number of kids in any birth cohort, which is something that's going on now, changes who might present themselves at the door of the program. And those things have a lot more to do with who you end up serving than your recruitment strategy or your outreach strategy or something like that. In the same way, if you think that, you know, these large trends don't uh, have a big impact on you and you're not a, in some way a prisoner of them, think about how the current recession, the Great Recession, is affecting the families that are trying to work with you and place your, their kids in your in your programs in various ways, and the kinds of stresses that those kids or those families are under, and how that might bubble up, frankly, within you know, the kinds of experiences that you're providing for kids. You just see this stuff all the time, right? In the same way, and this is a little closer to home, as changes in school accountability systems have mo have, and, and the co-funding of after-school programs through education dollars have very much changed the conversation about the degree to which after-school needs to support a school achievement, in the after-school community. So my point is simply that the takeaway is that these after-school programs are part of a larger system. The changing one system is never going to be as powerful as changing these mega trends that are driving all of this, and that any one system's effects are going to be relatively modest. You've got to have some humility when you step back and actually think about what's going on, right? I mean, you can be doing a dynamite job. But the kids' outcomes are being produced by a lot of stuff. What's going on in the rest of their daily experiences and how that is being shaped more societally by what's happening. So we have to have some modesty about all of this as we're thinking about what we're expecting out of programs and what we're thinking out of individual sites. The good news is that we now know that some sites still, with all of that going on, can really produce some differences. So the question is, why is that happening? Standards, like I was talking about earlier, uh, lead you to this kind of research study that many of you do as you're trying to build your case for funders. So what you do is you've got kids, they come to you in September, I'd say, and you administer something to those kids. You get some measure of how well they're doing, or maybe the school gives them to you. Then the kids spend some time in your programs and you measure them in the spring and you, if, it's, if the news looks good, you claim all success, and if the news looks bad, you sort of wave your hand about all those other factors that are going on or something like that, right? Clearly when you do that, if you're following my logic, what you're getting is not necessarily just the difference your program made, but the impact of your program and the rest of life, right? Kids do, in fact, learn something as they go through the rest of life, even if you're not putting them in school or something else. So some of these changes, up or down, are produced by the rest of life. And that has led most evaluations to try and handle that problem in some particular way. And the way they do it is something that is not going to be surprising to any of you. Don't get freaked out if you're not a researcher about this. I'm going to demystify all these things, right? So what people generally do is they try, and, in order to do an evaluation of the effects of something, they have some kids, some of them go off to the youth program, and then they try and find some kids that don't go off to the youth program, and they try and compare how well those two groups are doing after that fact. And the idea is you try and get kids at the beginning that are on average the same, right? So you have seen lots of studies like this. LA's best evaluation, takes kids that are coming to LA's best, goes out and finds a match comparison group, follows those kids in the schools and compares things like educational achievement and the rest of it later on. And it's not from day one to the end, it's how are we doing after we've had the program experience compared to the rest of life. Other evaluations, the After School Corporation's evaluation in New York, the evaluation going on at citizen schools, other evaluations I'm sure of programs here in Minneapolis have done this, as have done 
big deal evaluations that have really roiled the field like the Mathematica study of the 21st Century Learning Centers program. I want to make a couple of points about this because I think that one of the things that we all do is we overreact to individual studies as much as we overreact to individual sites or individual programs or individual kids. A couple of things. One thing is, is that one of the things that you were told in graduate school and now you're starting to experience is, is that you never want to pay a whole lot of attention to the results of one study. Well, why is that? Well, a couple of reasons. One is, is that unless the study was well designed, it probably, its findings are not quite as solid as you wish they were. Even in well-designed studies, the way the statistics work goes something like this. Your chances are one out of 20 of saying that something happened when in fact it was just due to chance. That's that whole statistical significance thing. Everybody kind of gets that. Oh, you know, we've got some findings here. They're saying it's significant. There's a real difference between these kids. But one out of 20 times, those differences are really specious. That's really not the big problem. There's another kind of mistake that studies are designed to try and handle. It's this kind of problem, missing something that's going on when in fact something really did happen. That's the problem that happens much more frequently in evaluations. It's something called, has to do with something called statistical power of these studies. But really what happens is that most of these studies are designed so that when something's happening, they will pick it up 80% of the time and they will miss it 20% of the time. It's a fact, okay? And we can talk about it and if you're a researcher you will know what I'm talking about. But the fact is, is that because science is supposed to sort of move conservatively and not overreact to chance things, these studies are designed, even when they're well designed, so about 20% of the time when the program has made a real difference, the evaluation will miss it. So. One of the things that you want to say is, well, I'm not going to overreact to the results of any one study because they may be missing some things. Second thing is just think about it. We had this design of what affects kids' lives. Any one evaluation, even a multi-site evaluation, is one set of kids at some point in time with the kids in that comparison group going off and getting services at one point in the community's life. So imagine you run the same study. And in one city, you run it, and there's a whole lot of alternative after-school services available to kids based versus this program. If the kid didn't get into your program, the kid went off and got into a whole lot of after-school services. Next study, same program, you're running it, not so many alternative services. So they either get you or they get almost nothing. Which one do you think makes more of a difference? One of the things you've got to really keep your eye on here is what's the benchmark, right? And it does lead you to believe that, in fact, you ought not to trust the results of any one study a whole lot. Fortunately, there are some folks that then step back and try and do reviews of lots of studies. And this is something that I've relied on in some of my writing and thinking to try and get a handle on why is it that some programs make a difference and other programs don't. So I'm going to walk you through this a little bit. There were three really good reviews done. These are reviews of studies. So these are an attempt to sit back and try and say, okay, not one study, but in the case of the first one, five studies. In the case of the second one, 30-some studies. In the case of the third review by Joe Durlach and Roger Weisberg, 60-some studies. If you look across a bunch of studies, what's the pattern of effects seem to be, right? Because now I'm not going to worry so much about we made a mistake in one. It's going to kind of get averaged out across a lot. And what you find, unfortunately, when you look at some of these various reviews, is that while their techniques are very similar in how to do the reviews, the re results or the news is not always the same. So, first guys that were looking at five studies said, well, after school programs don't make much of a difference. Second review said, ah, we've got, we've got effects and we've got them on math and we've got them on reading on average. These programs that were, these evaluations that we looked at actually were making a difference. And then in Joe Durlach and Roger Weisberg's review, they said, you know, it's even better news than that. Not only do we have some stuff happening in academics, but we've got some stuff happening in personal and social outcomes. So the question comes immediately, what the, what's going on here? I mean, do these guys, you know, simply do their stuff differently, or do they have different, different meats in the sausage maker? And really the answer is, is that they're looking at different sets of evaluations in most cases. So the first review is only looking at experimental studies of programs that are pretty traditional in their orientation, some homework help and some recreation. They have five studies that meet that test. One of the biggest ones which swamps their results is this 21st Century Community Learning Center evaluation that Mathematica did. 
The Lauer Review is a different thing. It's kind of out of school time. It's not just after school. It also has summer programs in it. But they said, I don't want every evaluation in the world of after school programs or summertime. What I'm going to do is I'm going to look for programs that had an academic focus and that were only serving kids who were at academic at risk. So we're going to change the population. We're going to have an academic focus. They find in that review average effects on math and, and, math and reading. Joe and, and, Joe and uh, Durlach and Roger, who were uh, you know, at Loyola and University of Illinois Chicago, and some of you know these guys, uh, they did something different. They said, I'm not interested so much in academic outcomes. What we're interested in, because this, this got hatched and we funded it back at the time where positive youth development was sort of just coming on the scene. And there was a lot of questions about positive youth development. Is this sort of soft-headed and soft-hearted stuff or does it actually make any difference at all? So what they did is they went out and found 66 evaluations of programs that expressly were after personal, social, or emotional outcomes. If the evaluation tended to measure some academic stuff, they also counted that too. So these are all 66 evaluations of programs that aren't after academics. They're after trying to help kids get along better, develop stronger you know, senses of responsibility, ability to follow through in groups, et cetera, et cetera. In these evaluations, this Blauer Review and the Durlach Review have been part of the reason why the conversation is changing from do these programs make a difference to uh, what is driving the difference. And you can say, by looking at these studies, although I'll take you through some of their warts in a second or some of their nuances, if somebody says, do programs make a difference, you should say, yeah, read Joe Durlach and Roger Weisberg's review. It'll tell you that these programs make a difference. Or read Patricia Lauer and her colleagues' reviews. It will tell you that these programs make a difference. It's kind of an interesting thing, though, and, and this is going to drive you nuts, I think. So, on average, but often not. And so, the, you know, your answer is like, what? <laughs> What's he talking about now? Let me, let me try and explain this to you. So, we've got, we got ten families up here at these two tables. And let's say, for sake of argument, that right now they're all making a thousand bucks a week in their household, right? So, they've got, you've got household incomes of a thousand dollars a week up here. Let's suppose a year from now, two of these folks that are up here at the front table kind of hit the jackpot, get good promotions, and now their households are making two grand a week, right? The total income of these 10 families has gone from 10 grand a week to $12,000 a week. The average income for these families has gone from $1,000 a week to $1,200 if you divide it by 10. But that's not really the story, is it? The real story is, is that two of them went from 1,000 to 2,000 and everybody else stayed right where they were. And that's really what's going on in these reviews. That on average, when you look across these studies, it averages out positive. But it's because you got some big winners driving the average in the direction just like these two families that are getting uh, uh, 1,000 bucks more a week. You guys can fight among yourselves as to who that is. This is another slide that's going to drive you a little nuts if you're not used to reading research things. I'm not going to focus on this effect size things, but I'm going to tell you how to read this table a little bit just to make my point. So Durlach and Weisberg, as I told you, even though they were after personal and social things, said, I wonder if these programs, when they measured, are making a difference. And this is a table that actually you can construct from Joe and, and Roger's work. What you have here is they took the studies and they said, okay, how many studies measured something like school engagement or school bonding or something like that? In their 66 evaluations, 31 of them did that, right? They said, how many in these evaluations had an achievement test that was being administered at the end as part of the program evaluation? Well, that's 22 of them. 26 of them had some measure of grades. Sometimes it's from transcripts, sometimes from teachers. And 21 of them measured school attendance. And the numbers to the right are how big a, how big a difference that evaluation showed that program to make. And those numbers there are the numbers of studies. So the, to the right of 31, if you do the math, you realize that those, that row adds up to 31 studies. And the way to think about this is 11 studies showed a positive and probably statistically significant difference on school engagement, right? That's 11. It's, this effect size thing is not something I want to talk about because it's just too mysterious if you don't get it. But think about it as those are things where we had some positive findings. 13 of the studies actually showed no difference between the program group and whatever comparison or control group they were using. In seven studies, it actually looked like the control group was doing a little better. Now, think about that. What's that mean? Well, that means that programs being run, 
Kids have access to other services. Kids go off into those other services. Outcomes of the two groups get compared, and it turns out that on average for that particular study, whatever else was out there was beating, you know, what you were offering on school engagement, right? Achievement tests, you see the picture. 11 studies, good news. Nine studies, not so much. Two studies, actually negative, and you see how it goes. The result of all of that is, is that when you average all of those things together, it's a little bit like the two families that got the extra two grand. That what's going on here is that in some of those studies that are in the positive column, they really made a big difference. Now, do we know why? We're starting to, right? That's the clue and that's the quiz that we're going to try and, you know, the question we're going to try and follow through on later on as we go through this stuff. What did these guys do? Well, the, the meta-analysts, the people doing these reviews, they tried to torture the data a little bit and figure out if they could figure out what was going on. So one of the things they do is they do things like ask the question, did the quality of the research design predict whether or not a program is going to show big effects? Like if I look at the experimental studies versus the quasi-experimental studies, does that make a difference? No. Did the grouping strategy that the program used to work with kids make a difference? Well, Lauer, interesting thing. They found that the grouping strategy did predict which kinds of effects would be positive. For reading, one-on-one -on -one tutoring and mixed grouping were the kinds of programs that showed the biggest differences in reading achievement. A little bit frustrating that in math, one-on-one -on -one grouping was the one strategy that showed absolutely no positive results at all, right? So you get this mix across different outcomes and different things that they looked at in the Lauer Review that leads you nowhere clear as to what you would do as a program manager or as a policy person. It's just a frustrating thing, but people are, are torturing the data and they're figuring out that they can't figure out what predicted these effects in these studies from the data that we had. Joe Durlach and Roger Weisberg did the same thing. And this is an acronym that's traveling around our field a lot now. What they did is before they knew the results, they said, let's categorize these programs. This was not done, one of the strengths of it, it was not done after the fact where, you know, you go off and kind of come up with this explanation after you've seen the news which we're all pretty good at. But what Joe and Roger did was they said, given past evaluations that we know about, we think that if a program gets kids actively involved, is focused in its activities, is pretty explicit on activities that relate to particular goals, and in their, in their language, also had a sequenced approach to doing the program, they turn it around and make it a word, safe, active, focused, explicit, or sequenced, active, focused, explicit, safe, they wondered if those kinds of programs that had those characteristics were the ones that were driving the good news in their, in their review of various evaluations. And this is a pretty stunning <laughs> slide. This is why this is going around our field a lot. On the left, I told you early on that in the Durlach review of 66 evaluations on eight outcome areas, the program showed to make a positive difference on seven of them. The only one that didn't get significant results was on school attendance, which is a little bit scary for some of us that are tying our outcomes to making a difference on school attendance. So the only one in that review that did not show a positive effect for after school programs is school attendance. They got positive effects on average in achievement tests, school grades, social skills, problem behaviors, and the rest of it, right? But then look what the other news is. They got about 30 studies of that 66 that fall into the safe cluster, and they've got about 36 studies that fall into the cluster that didn't have those characteristics. The safe ones, all of those programs got results. The ones that didn't have safe, none of those programs got results on any of them on average. And it leads you to believe, they're, Jesus, I don't know what this proves, but it certainly shows you that some of the action must be something that's going on within these programs that are explicit and focused and the rest of it. Now, the thing you have to take away from this, though, is that doesn't mean that because the programs did those things, they got the results that they got. It simply predicted the kind of impacts that they found. So what we are doing now is we are shifting the conversation, trying to explain and get under the skin of this stuff to understand what these guys are doing to get the results that they're starting to see, right? So where do we go for that? Well, we go to a variety of locations. I'm going to show you what you get when you go to the web in half a second, but you know, if you're like me, one of the places I try and go is I go to the web. So I'm going to go to the web and I'm going to see if I can find out what it says about best practices in after school and I'm going to see if I can learn anything about that. There are four other places that I would encourage you also to go to in addition to the web. 
One is, is that many of you know in Minneapolis that the Weikert Center, when it was high, part of High Scope and now is affiliated with the Forum for Youth Investment, was thinking about developing this thing called the Youth Program Quality Assessment Instrument. And it was a real political problem because most people that had standards for youth programs believed that what they were doing was really unique and special. So the American camping folks, you can't have an instrument that measures us and measures 4-H at the same time. You know, because what we do is really quite different, right? And if you are, you know, the National Institute of Out-of-School Time or NSACA or, you know, blah, 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 you have a set of standards for youth programs. And you really have a set of standards for the programs that work with you, and they probably don't fit these other things. So one of the political problems of anybody trying to come up with a measure of youth program quality is thinking about how you handle that kind of thing. So we were smart enough that we brought about 20 folks together representing different organizations into a meeting in Washington with Nicole Yahalem and Karen Pittman and some other folks back in the early part of, uh, of this decade. And we took all of their standards and then we did an analysis of how much they were the same and how much they were different. And everybody did have a bell or a whistle, but they all had a common core. I mean, it was really kind of stunning. They all had a common core. And I'm going to show you what that common core was in just a minute. But whether you were talking about 4-H or you were talking about, you know, Big Brothers, B, I mean, uh, Boys and Girls Clubs, or whether you were talking about Girls Inc. or whether you were talking, there was a common core that fit what other people were talking about, too. <clears throat> Another place to look, and some, there, you know, I know that the Bale and his center is involved a little bit, is some people get really inside of programs and try and figure out what's going on. The three favorites that I have are Robert Halpern's work, if you haven't read it, Bart Hirsch's work with other people in Big Brothers and Big Sisters in Chicago and now in After School Matters, and Reed Larson's work in Illinois and also in Minnesota now with Kate Walker and Dale Blythe and other people in the room. These studies are saying, you know, the way to really figure out what makes a difference is get in there and watch. Try and figure out by watching really hard what it is that youth workers are doing with kids in these programs where the kids really get engaged and stuck into this stuff versus turning those people off. Really try and figure out what it is that people are doing at the point of service that get kids to keep coming back and feel like the program's important, that they're learning something, that they matter in this environment. There's another kind of observational work that is done that is not quite like that. It's much more structured. This is this YPQA stuff. And there's studies that you can find, and I can give you references to, particularly Deborah Vandell's work, Liz Reesner's work, and Charles Smith's work. It's YPQA. These guys go in with pretty structured observational systems, frankly aligned with these common sets of things that the various standards people say, and say, how much of this is going on in this particular program? Another place that you should never devalue is your own work and your own observations, right? If you're sitting here waiting for research to kind of deliver the news, I think research can sharpen the lens. Research can help you convince yourself of some things that you might not do that, you know, and sort of get you rid of some stuff. Research is never going to go off and find stuff that is going to create an aha for an experienced practitioner. What they can do is they can help you decide to not do some stuff and do some other things. Or they can tell you something about the consequence of doing it this way versus that way. But researchers are not nearly as close to these kids in these programs as you are. So one of the things you do all the time is you are trying to make things better. You're changing the staff development. You're trying to shape your policies. You're trying to do something with the way you hire and fire or the way in which you, you know, coach staff, et cetera, et cetera. And what I'm encouraging you to do is really watch that, what that seems to bubble up as when you watch people actually working with kids because that's where it has to bubble up. If it doesn't bubble up there, the kids aren't going to get any of it, right? There's this wonderful book that a buddy of mine wrote back in the early 90s called The Classroom Crucible. There's a real fiction in a lot of the reform movements in any one of these systems about how things very far away from the actual point of service can make a difference. And, and Ed Pauley's total point was, look, it, if ed reform doesn't penetrate the classroom walls, tell me how it's going to affect student achievement, right? It's the same thing in every one of these fields. If it doesn't penetrate the interactions between social workers, and families and services in the child welfare system, when you're reforming child welfare, it's not going to make much of a difference in child outcomes. So, and then finally, there is a terrific compilation that was done of these various measures, these things, these structured observation measures, done by the Forum for Youth Investment. It's in its second round. It's got a lot of good information. It's got good stuff for practitioners. It's written in language that is not highfalutin. 
and it's on the website for the Forum for Youth Investment. So, what do all those things seem to show? What do they say about what the deal is? Well, first I went to the web, and I Googled these things, right? I said, give me best practices in K-12 education. And Google gave me 4,900,000 hits. Apparently, the world knows a lot about after-school programs if they're hyphenated versus if they're not, right? <laughs> because if they're hyphenated, we've got 11,400,000 best hits on best practices. If they're not hyphenated, we only got 163,000 websites that tell you what the best practices are. It's impossible, it's totally impossible to go to sort of this source and figure. Now, what most of this is, is well intended, and the interesting news is that much of it, if you read 4,900,000 websites, you'd probably come to some of the same conclusions that some of these folks have already come to when they've designed these instruments or when they've made these standards. So I'm going to save you a little work there, right? The thing that I want you to uh, uh, think about for a second is if there's a consensus in this field, maybe it's represented in these observational measures that the forum has already reviewed. That's the cover of the book that I want you, if you haven't looked at it before, to download off of the website. You don't have to pay a dime for it. Uh, and you can get it off of the Forum for Youth Investment website. All right. This is hard to read. It's hard to read for me because I got old eyes and I got a small slide. But one of the things that has happened is, is that as the forum has analyzed these various websites and as they analyze these standards from the various standard setting groups, they realize that everybody, when they talk about program quality, is talking about the same six things and then some other stuff. Everybody is talking about the relationships between the staff and the kids. Everybody is talking about the psychological and physical safety of the environment. Everybody is talking about what staff do to breed engagement of kids. Everybody is talking about what staff do to create positive social norms in this program of cooperation and how conflict and aberrant behavior gets handled. Everybody is talking about what staff do to build opportunities for active student engagement or active youth engagement. And everybody is talking about the importance of some predictable, sensible routine to the program's day and its sequence of activities. And I don't care if you're 4-H or if you're 21st century or if you're whatever. These programs, all of them, are talking about this at their core. Now, they may be talking about other things, like how important it is to have certain management practices in the program, how important it is to have certain forms of parent involvement in the program and the rest of it, right? But everybody's talking about those things. And every one of these instruments that is in this book at least measures the stuff that's in the center of that diagram. That some of them do it better than others, but everybody does it. So let's think about why a measure might be useful to you. One of the things that happens in a field that doesn't have a lot of pre-service preparation and has a lot of different programs and funding streams and the rest of it is that people have very different languages for how to think about their work, right? And in many cases, you know, when I was a, I was like a TFA kid when I first started teaching, right? I, they didn't have T Teacher for America those days, 30 nine years ago or 40 years ago or something. But when I came out in 68, you know, I, I, I had an economics degree and I went and I taught second grade in a migrant community. And I had not a clue what I was doing, right? And some of you in the audience may have shared that kind of experience where you come out of an undergraduate program, you go off to do work and you just don't have a clue. You know, I was cool, the kids liked me, I liked the kids, they learned jack, I learned a lot, right? And so, <laughs> what, what that, and I was, I was struggling for a, a framework for how to think about my work. And I know that youth program staff really respond favorably when they're given some buckets to talk about their work in and they're given some language to talk about their work. And I know that supervisors find some usefulness to this. And I know the degree to which those instruments or whatever help people do things like self-assessment and coaching on site, the programs turn out to be better places for kids than otherwise, okay? I just know those things now. And I think we know those things in research too. One of the, th one of the bugaboos though is you need a good tool. Now these tools can vary. There are some of them that are pretty explicit like the YPQA and Deborah Vandell's Promising Practices Rating Scale. They say, you know, in this area of, uh, let's say, creating a warm and supportive environment, you get a zero if staff are doing this kind of stuff, 
You get a one if they're doing that kind of stuff. You get a two if they're doing this kind of stuff. And each one of those things is described, right? Like the behaviors that get you kind of a one versus a two versus a three are described. Other instruments go kind of like this. Does the staff establish a warm environment? Zero to five, right? That second one is really hard for two people to agree on. That second one is really hard for somebody that hasn't been around for 15 or 20 years in the field, or at least some period of time, to know how to even think about that, right? So there's real differences in these instruments at this point, and the ones that feel more like a rubric are probably more helpful to you if you have some of these anchor points established. The other thing is, is that if you're gonna use these to try and improve your program over time, and you see changes in scores across time, you don't want it just because Joyce is watching you one day and I'm watching you the next day, right? You want two people watching the same stuff to agree. So that if I'm watching you the second day, you're not just getting my opinion and it looks like it's worse or better when it actually it's exactly the same as when Joyce is watching you a little bit earlier that week. Or if two different supervisors are in your program, you want them to be coming to the same conclusions about different staff activities. Or if different staff are in your program, as they obviously are, you want them to be thinking about their work with some reliability to it. Second thing, is you hope not only do we have the same judgment, we're making judgments about important stuff, right? That is not trivial stuff. And I will tell you that some of these instruments do more to measure point of service activities and less to measure things far away. And other ones make the opposite choice. They have a lot of items about stuff far away from where kids are getting worked with and more at the point of service. And frankly, those that measure point of service stuff tend to be more predictive of child outcomes than those that don't. That's just the punchline there, right? So you're looking for things that are clear, that are anchored, that have some good reliability and validity and research speak, but that's all it is. So different raters will agree, and so something important is getting measured. We actually asked Charles Smith at one point, I was doing a presentation for a group of people in K-12 education. There is, and it shouldn't surprise you now, there is exactly the same kind of conversation going on in K-12 education. If you think that K-12 educators know what it is that distinguishes a classroom that is getting value-added differences on student achievement from a classroom that isn't, you are just not paying attention to the details, because they don't. It's a real hot debate. What they know is, is that the way we've always tried to create incentives that that'll happen are not very efficient. In fact, don't work at all. So requiring everybody to get a master's degree shows you nothing in the difference of teachers, predicts nothing about the difference of individual teachers or groups of teachers to add value to student achievement versus not. There is an instrument, therefore, that has grown up that measures K-12 teaching. It's called the CLASS, Classroom Assessment Scoring System. It's built, developed by a guy named Bob Pianta. He's actually got an early childhood version of it. It's being used nationally in Head Start as part of the periodic annual evaluation in Head Start. But it grew out of a set of studies that were trying to follow a birth cohort of kids as they moved out of early childhood into the schools. So Bob's got class, right? It's an instrument just like some of these others that I was talking about. And I said to Charles, I said, how close is what you guys measure to what Bob measured? Because that's K-12, and you're on to this other thing, right? And not only are your stuff, but because this Deborah Vandell instrument's a pretty good one, this promising practice rating scale, how much do you guys agree? That's the news. Right? Now, it's not perfect. Not everybody is saying that we agree perfectly, but there's pretty high agreement by people that have done a lot of work in K-12 education about the teaching practices, the distinguished teachers that get differences in student achievement over and above prior performance in those classrooms that don't. And there is similar agreement about what is going on within youth programs, I think at least as captured in these instruments, about what matters and what doesn't. One of the interesting things is, is that while they agree on what they agree on, they don't agree on everything. So, for example, the YPQA does more on active involvement in, uh, than, than any one of the uh, promising practices instrument or the K-12 instrument does. So where they agree, they agree, but there are some additional things that at least the YPQA... Let me show you what, it, how, what I mean by agreement. So those are the three anchor points that come to you when you look at whether or not, if you're watching, the teacher and as establishing warmth. Look at how closely those things are worded. All of them think that open-ended questions are important. Look at how closely those things are worded. I mean, they look like, you know, it just was a, you know, the way they wrote it on a different day or something, right? I mean, 
These are twins, or these are triplets, or these are something like that. These are people saying to us that what makes a difference is pretty similar across these various outcomes. So, our job, collectively for our field, in youth mentoring, in youth employment, in after school, in youth out of school time, in K-12 education, is to try and really be sure or get clear about the staff practices that actually produce a difference. I will give you the punchline right now about what we know about that. The punchline, in addition to those six things that everybody measures, goes something like this. You need staff working with kids in ways that manage the group well, so that you get an emotionally supportive, psychologically safe, physically safe environment where people aren't bouncing off the walls, it's a predictable routine and the rest of it. You need staff working with kids in ways that feel emotionally supportive to kids. The kids read as emotionally supportive. It doesn't mean that everybody at every age and every situation reads the same behavior as emotionally supportive. But it does certainly mean that certain activities or certain behaviors on the part of staff are less likely to be read as emotionally supportive. We can think of that sort of as parents on our better and less good days, right? And then the sec third thing is, is that something interesting and important has to be going on. There's got to be some content that's interesting and important to the kids. You know, they're the clients here. So if you do the, those three things, these guys are just breaking it down in finer gradations. But it is something that is well managed, emotionally supportive, warmth, and something interesting and important going on. We are doing a lot of work at the foundation, and I'm encouraging other people to do a lot of work to try and put some more meat on those bones, because that's not enough. If I'm a new youth worker, you tell me to do those things, I'm like, yeah, right. So how do you do that? Break it down for me. Tell me more about what it is. Get me involved in that process so that I can learn more about what it is that I'm doing and what I'm not doing so well. And because I'm not particularly adept at reflecting on my own work while it's going on because I'm trying to handle 27 things at the same time, I want you, my supervisor, to think of yourself as a coach, you know, and a mentor for me. And I want to have that kind of relationship with you. And I'm not talking sort of Woody Hayes, Bear Bryant kind of coach, right? I'm talking about something else that is actually coaching and working on mastery and building on strengths and thinking about it that way rather than, you know, sort of the bull in the china shop. All right. I'm sure that there was a wonderful coach at the university whose name I should just remember, but I don't remember. One of the things that we have done is we have asked people to measure the practices that they are using and track outcomes over time and see if they can get a change in youth practices happening that is also related to some positive changes in youth outcomes. The Gates Foundation is actually spending $49 million on a study like this in K-12 education, where they are videotaping 4,000 classrooms at different points during the year, at different subject matters and different age levels. And they are using a variety of observational measures and other measures to try and look at changes in classroom practices across the year and tracking changes in student achievement across the year to see if they can figure out those practices that seem to be making a difference. We're going to learn from that in this field because I'm convinced that at some level, good youth work is like good teaching, or good teaching maybe is like good youth work, right? So that's one way to think about it. But if you've been following this, both of those things could be happening for reasons like eh, the tough kids are dropping out, right? So we're getting more supportive and more fuzzy and more intentional and more focused in our work and their outcomes are going up and it's because we got rid of the, the guys that were really causing us some trouble. And that happens, right? That happens. Particularly it happens if the stakes are very high for producing the outcome. So another way to do it is like this. It's the same kind of study that I talked to you about before. This is the kind of study that Charles has done. Charles Smith has just done recently with the YPQA. What they did is they had a bunch of centers they used a lottery to get, have some of them get their staff development program, another group not to get the staff development program. They went in and tried to measure at the second time, are these staff working any differently with the kids than, than the group of staff over here that weren't in our professional development program, right? Now, those staff in the, in the non Weikert, non YPQA group, they're not like sleeping through life over there. They're, in fact, getting trained by NIOST, and in some cases, they're doing their own YPQA and all their stuff. But this is really a question of the value added of the difference that, that Charles' intervention is making. What he's been able to prove so far is, is that it was possible through systematic coaching of site supervisors and some continuing support for them, where those site supervisors then coached line staff using the YPQA to get some important differences on the variety of things that the YPQA measures in the core. 
What we don't know yet from that study is whether the youth outcomes then subsequently change too. And that is a big hole in the literature right now. We got to get there. If I was going to make a bet, I would do something like use one of these instruments, but I would also try and make sure that I was also measuring some changes in youth outcomes. I'm going to close with one last slide. I've started to date any advice that I give to anybody. Because <laughs> it changes, right? I mean, you know, you, let's hope it continues to change. I guess I actually don't hope it continues to change. I hope it continues to get better. So one of the things that I have done is I've tried to step back at this point and say, if I was going to talk to a group of policymakers and practitioners and a variety of youth serving systems and say, what should you do? These are the eight things. And I'm going to dwell a little bit on one, four, five, and eight, but I'm not going to dwell much on it because I've gone on long enough already. One is to focus on the point of service. It is true that you often need to make changes in the organization that aren't right in the classroom or aren't right in the youth work center or the place where kids and line staff are meeting in order to get changes there. But as you try and improve your staff development, as you try and improve your management structure, as you try and improve your data system, as you try and improve the involvement of your board in fundraising and activities and resources for the program, for God's sakes, keep track of what's going on with, between the kids and the line staff. That's the point here. Because if it doesn't get there, it may be important, but it's not sufficient, right? It may be necessary, but it's not sufficient. So I'm all for thinking about importance of policy and importance of management practices, but it's got to eventually penetrate the point of service. Get kids actively involved. This is something that varies, of course, by age of kids and nature of program and all the rest of it. I have seen people do tremendous work in very adult-directed youth programs. And I have seen people do lousy work in very youth-directed youth programs. So this is no panacea, but getting kids involved and making choices about what they do, how they do it, and sort of in charge of their learning seems to come with a whole lot of other good stuff. See these staff-youth interactions as key. Focus on the nature of them. Develop a language about them. Develop an ability to coach on them. Build on the comparative advantage of after school. There's a lot of conversations right now We've got all these settings. Some are good or better at other things. There's a lot of conversation as we have debates about the future of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act and the 21st Century Community Learning Center funding stream and the degree to which after school should become an extension of the learning time that looks like the school day or an extension of the learning time that looks like something else. I think unquestionably it should be an extension of the learning time that looks like something else, all right? You, ought to, you think about it, you know, it is like a time when kids can spend more time on stuff than they can in these 45 minute or 50 minute periods, where they can take on different roles. I learned a lot when I went to Camp Fitch and I was on the dish crew when I was 13. It was a Y camp on the shores of Lake Erie. And if you go to a camp these days, you know, the inmates are running the prison, right? I mean, these are all kids that are the counselors and the counselors in training. They have extraordinarily important jobs in all of these camps. Why is it that we can rely on people in summer camp to be the counselors and the counselors in training and do a whole lot of youth work, and when we get the same people back in their after-school program, we worry about how actively engaged they are? So I think you need to give kids time to work on stuff, Ability to get outside of the building's walls, to do stuff that's important to them and the rest of it. So I, I'm all for things that will make a difference for important school outcomes, but I think you want to pay, play to the comparative advantage of after school. Continuous improvement. None of this stuff ever is done. Now that's frustrating, right? Staff change over. Staff can always get better. My advice is going to change. If I talk to you, you know, six months from now, I hope I got something different on this list. So it never stops. You've got to hammer it all the time. You've got to work on building that kind of culture. We're doing great. We can do better. Right? That's the way you have to think about this. There is a lot of use to using a good tool, a good tool, in helping you develop this common vocabulary. And I made this point sort of in flyby about the youth work and the work with kids. I think it goes exactly the same on the work with staff. I would ask you to remember an assignment that you passed in when you were in high school to an English teacher. And you know, you passed your theme in, and in one situation, you got it back, and it looked like it needed a transfusion, right? It's just got, there's red ink all over this thing. 
And then in another one you got back, there was like three comments on it. It went something like, I really like this, do more of that. No red ink at all. I know which person I'm going to go talk to. I know which one I'm going to try and learn from more. I know which thing I'm going to try and pay attention to, right? I can't deal with all that red ink, and kids can't either. And so what you want to do is not be Pollyannish about this, but get there by having high standards and then working on people's strengths. That doesn't mean anything goes. That means that you're getting there through a very strategic, mastery-oriented work. And then if I was trying to think about policy, one of the things that I think will distort any of these systems, particularly systems that can choose who it is that they're going to work with, like youth employment programs, like mentoring programs, like after-school programs in many cases, once you have that sort of situation, you've got to be very cautious about cert making certain outcome levels, high stakes outcome levels. What I would encourage you to do if you're in a policy position is hold programs and staff accountable for doing the seven things that I've got above this, working continuously on making them better, tracking how kids are doing, how their practices are changing, trying to have that kind of conversation in an ongoing way. And if people don't do that, then they should be in jeopardy, because I think that's what it takes to get the job done. But if I'm simply going to hold people accountable for changes in youth outcomes, what I will do is I will drive creaming in the field, and I will have people starting to serve kids that need it less and, so, and having kids that need it more sent to the side. So that would be my version of accountability. That's the last thing I had to say to you. You've been great this morning. Thank you very much.